Well, listen, I'm, I'm so thrilled to be in your company, and uh, I hope you're doing well today. I know it's been a very unconventional semester, uh, but kudos to all of you for um, bringing your best thinking, bringing your best intellectual acuity to this semester. I've heard great things about all of you, and please know I'm very, very honored to be uh, to be here with you, especially to talk about this, this, this book. I mean, this is a great book. Um, that I feel like it culminates some of the debating and um, some of the discussion that you've had so far within the context of this course. Uh, so you've been talking about leadership, different forms of leadership, what constitutes leadership. Uh, some of you have you know, read the, the works of Machiavelli. You know, is it all about strategy? Is it about tactics? Is it about practice? Um, you know, it's almost if you think about a chessboard. Is it about shifting and making moves, right? This is chess, not checkers, right? Is it that approach? Or is it in the, the vein of Erasmus who says, hey, we need to consider the core of a person. And that speaks to leadership. Perhaps it's a, it's a combination of the two. Uh, but, I, but one question I would like for you to be thinking critically about throughout this lecture is one, um, more important than the other, does one serve as a premise for a true, authentic, effective expression of leadership? Uh, and so I want you to be thinking about that question as we go through uh, some, some of the, the, the interesting themes that are referenced throughout this book, Strength, Strength and Love by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. So um, before we, we jump into the, the heart of the lecture, I think we've got to talk briefly about this word leadership. Because that's what you've been talking about, you know, for a number of weeks. And people define leadership different ways, right? Leadership is different than bossship. Uh, leadership is different than management. Uh, John Maxwell, contemporary writer, would say that leadership is all about influence, nothing more, nothing less, right? You. But I think many of us in this room, we would say, hey, it's not just influence, it's also how are you wielding the influence to effectuate change? So there's a host of leadership books that are, that are on the market. You know, our dear friend, Dr. Paul Keck, probably has all of them in his office. Um, but, but one thing that we know is that at the heart of most leadership definitions is the word change. Where leadership is present, Things change. They move from one point to another point. Not necessarily positive change. But leaders effectuate change. But I want you to think about this. A lot of times when you read you know, contemporary leadership articles, usually there's a focus on change within an environment or a context or an organization. I think the book that we're about to process together, Dr. Martin Luther King challenges us to think about change that takes place within us. Before I can effectuate effective change around me, it's so critical that I think about the change that needs to happen within me. I see a lot of heads nodding. And that's the essence of the themes that are referenced in the book by, by Dr. King's Strength to Love. Um, something else I would like to note before we get into the heart of the lecture, the title of the book, right? Strength to Love. Um, I, don't, I don't know if any of us would land on that particular title, but there's a lot of meaning just in those words being coupled together, the notion of strength to love, that it takes strength to love. Uh, and if you think about the way that love is depicted, quite often in our society, it seems very seamless, it's organic, it's free-flowing, you know, it's fluid. Am I right about it? I mean, if you look at the latest Netflix drama, yeah, I mean, love is just, it, it, it's, it's, it seems easy. And so Dr. King helps us redefine our notion of love, that, that the expression and a commitment to love actually takes intention. 
It requires work, especially to love those who we would denote as our enemies. Right? That's at the essence of, of this particular book and definitely a predominant theme with, within the book. So some real quick literary context. The book was published in 1963. I think most of the historians in the room, you know that the Civil Rights Act was actually um, uh, approved and passed in 1964. So in 1963, most of you are familiar with uh, all that was happening socially and racially within this nation, particularly in the southeast region of our country. Um, for the most part, communities of color, especially black people, were disenfranchised. They were discriminated discriminated against. Uh, quite often, they, they didn't have the same degree of opportunity um, and access as their white counterparts during that time. And so the civil rights movement has generated traction and momentum. And it is important to note, the civil rights movement just didn't include advocates who were black. There were many who were white and of other uh, racial and ethnic backgrounds and different genders who are part of that specific movement, right? But that's the context. I mean, it's 1963. Uh, to be frank with you, a number of the, the chapters that, that you will read about in the book, Dr. King actually drafted them while he was in prison, while he was in jail. And we can't help those of us who are believers and who are, you know, literate when it comes to, to, to the Bible, we can't help but denote the parallel between Dr. King's experience and the experience of Paul the Apostle, right? Many of the letters that we read about that are housed in the New Testament, most, many of them were drafted by Paul while he was in, while he was in prison, okay? Also, when you, when you start to read this book, or for those who are already reading, you, you've noticed that there's a total of, of 15 chapters but to be more specific, they're really sermons, right? It's like a montage of sermons. And so all of the chapters threaded throughout is, is this biblical evidence and scriptural reference that kind of serves as a premise for all of the thoughts and principles that are shared in, in the book, okay? Thirdly, um, the audience for this book is, is, is pretty diverse. And so you see that Dr. King isn't writing this book just for black Americans. He's also writing this book for any person who may be curious to learn more about what does it mean to elevate racial justice with a Christian lens? What does it mean to lead with Christian principles at the core of who I am to inform my action, to inform my practice, to inform my my speech and my and my engagement. So it's written to a diverse a diverse audience, and that is important to really grasp. So even individuals who may have been um, critical of Dr. King's approach and um, overarching agenda, and if they were just curious and wanted to read to see what is this King guy all about, I think Dr. King writes this in a way and. That's so compelling that possibly it would even convict and move a person who's in this space of, you know, segregation, maybe in a space of hatred, to move closer to a place of, of a beloved community, right? A, a space of, of racial justice. Okay? So that's important to, to, to know. And I, I've kind of alluded to this in, in my previous comment. There is this targeted approach. Uh, that Dr. King uses. Um, so when you read uh, the, the, the sermons that are comprised within this book, you'll see that, I mean, Dr. King is definitely intellectually astute. He's brilliant. The way that he um, couples words and phrases and imagery and, and his history um, and, and all of his themed and, 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 and well-versed and connected together, you see that. But but yes, it stimulates the mind, but it also stimulates and targets the effective domain and the heart. And I think he does that purposefully, right? Because change is not just an intellectual endeavor. 
Change requires stimulation of the heart. One that's convicted. Their heart is convicted. And so he, he uses, uses that, that kind of dualistic approach throughout the, throughout the book. All right? So what I want to share with you are, are three leadership lessons that I took away from the book. There are way more. I want you to know there are way more that are included. You're going to enjoy this uh, this book, no doubt about it. If you have, if, for those of you who have already read it, how many of you have already started reading it? Okay, good. That's 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 fantastic. So I hope you're enjoying it. I hope you're thinking intentionally about the context. That's the reason why I spend so much time here. I think all of you know, as emerging scholars, we just don't read a book at face value. That one of the first things that we always have to do is make sure that we have a clear understanding of the historical context, right? Even before you read like a, an epistle in scripture, you first ask yourself, okay, who wrote this? Who are they writing to? What was the time frame, right? What was the culture during this time? And there are so many other variables that one can, can consult to develop a, a full picture of what's taking place during that time. And so, so I'm hoping as we talk about this, especially in this first slide, you start to picture the, the age, the environment, the, the context that Dr. King was, uh, was, was, was leading in. So, so as, a, as a theme for my lecture or a title for my lecture, you see it at the bottom of the slide, uh, more than a dream, a countercultural approach to leadership. Uh, quite often, Dr. King is really reduced, sometimes in our nation and in classrooms, Dr. King is reduced to the I have a dream speech. That's, that's sometimes elevated in February, right, which is Black History Month, or maybe in January when we celebrate his birthday. But what you're going to gather from reading this book is that his leadership is, is, is more expansive than just his communication skills. Okay? Now, this is one thing. Was he a perfect man? Of course not. He had his flaws just like any leader that we know of. And we see in scripture, even in more contemporary society. But you see a person who's really convicted um, to, to lead in a very countercultural way. And I, I think um, because that's the focus of, of the book, it is so relevant for our consideration being at a Christian higher ed institution. And being many of you, you, you plan to be. Christian leaders in a host of different industries. What does that look like? And so I think you'll be able to glean some, some really strong principles from this, from this book, Strength to Love. So leadership lesson number one, please jot this down. Cultivate a tough mind and a tender heart. All right, this is actually the title of chapter one or sermon one that's referenced in the book, Strength to Love. Cultivate a tough mind and a tender heart. Or, okay. And as a form of scriptural reference or base, Dr. King uses this passage out of Matthew chapter 10, verse 16. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. And so we see this stark contrast. Right, we have these animals that most of us are familiar with. You see the sheep. Most of us would perceive a sheep as being innocent. By no means would we identify uh, sheep as, as, as a predator. Typically, sheep are, are what? Prey and, and, and in desperate need of a shepherd for protection. Right? And so remember, Jesus shares this with his disciples. You know, as they prepare to be commissioned into the world to, to carry out their, their purpose. And so Jesus says, hey, you are sheep in the midst of wolves, which, which really gives us indication of how rigorous, how dangerous the environment was for the disciples. But it wasn't a coincidence that Dr. King was referencing this passage and aligning it with the context within uh, the 1960s. For those who were committed to advancing racial justice and equity. Like you are actually sheep. Especially those of you who are committed to leading. Using a nonviolent approach. You are sheep in the midst of wolves. 
So, since these are the conditions, you've got to be wise as serpents and harmless as, as doves. So we see two things if you want to jot these down. First, the, the importance of being able to think critically. Wise as serpents, to be decisive, decisive. To some degree, to be cunning, to be able to assess what is true and false, to be discerning. To be willing to engage the rigors of deep thinking, wise wisdom. We can't help but think of the of Solomon, who was gifted with, with wisdom. Like that is critical in leadership, to be able to think decisively and deeply. But if we rely solely on deep thought and critical thought, it can breed arrogance. And so Dr. King says, yes, you've got to be wise as serpent. Yes, you've got to have this tough mind. But it's also important for you to have this compassionate heart. What does that mean? I'm humble. I see people as people. I engage people with love rather than an agenda. The, the, the bottom line is that the motive for change is founded, is founded on love. And actually, in Scripture, we see quite often in the Gospels, um, Jesus, uh, you see this phrase uh, used by, by the authors where they say Jesus um, had compassion on the multitude or the person that he decided to heal. Like I think it's referenced formally like five times in the Gospels. So, so it, it's not enough to think critically. It's, it's, it's critical that we are also compassionate. Being compassionate without critical thought, though, leads to aimless life. So you can't have one without the other. They need to be coupled together. Deep thought without compassion leads to an egocentric life devoid of passion and love. But when the two are combined... They lead to assertive, productive action that's effectuated with thoughtfulness and grace. You know, the, to hold the essence of these two realities, critical thought or thoughtfulness and compassion, it really translates to a person's character. A person's character, their internal internal core. Tough mind and a tender heart. Leadership lesson number two, establish a firm foundation for leadership. Establish a firm foundation for leadership. Dr. King references the crucifixion that's referenced in the Gospels. It is a marvelous expression of Jesus' ability to match words with actions. One of the greatest tragedies of life is that men seldom bridge the gulf between practice and profession, between doing and saying. Um, most leadership writers will share with you that the essence of leadership is not so much tactics and strategy, but it's integrity and credibility. Uh, one of my favorite leadership authors, Kuzis and Osler, they write the book, The Leadership Challenge. And what they share is the foundation of leadership is credibility. It's congruence between what we say and what we do. It's the congruence between what we say and what we do. And that equates to integrity. And it, it really answers the question, am I a leader that's, 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 that, that holds the value that holds the integrity to recruit and to maintain followership. Congruence between what I say and what I do. When you think about Jesus, he preached forgiveness to his disciples quite often. It's even referenced in what we call the Lord's Prayer. And when Jesus 
Jesus was on the cross, probably the, the words that we remember the most when he was on the cross is, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The strength to love, right? That's so countercultural. For most of us, and me included, when someone does me wrong, the natural inclination is to want what? Revenge. I want this person to be obliterated, right? But it requires strength to be intentional and to lean on internal values, principles, and, 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 and spiritual core to say, no, forgive them. Forgive them. Right? So, leadership lesson number two, establish a firm foundation. I, I like what Dr. King references in in chapter 4, love in action. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them. Then, when he was being plunged into the abyss of nagging agony. Then, when man had stooped to his worst. Then, when he was dying a most brutal death. Then, when the wicked hands of the creature had dared to crucify the only begotten son of the creator. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them. That then might well have been otherwise. He could have said, Father, get even with them. Or Father, let loose the mighty thunderbolts of righteous wrath and destroy them. Or Father, open the floodgates of justice and permit the staggering avalanche of retribution to pour upon them. But none of these was his response. Those subjected to inexpressible agony Suffering excruciating pain and despised and rejected. Nevertheless, he cried, Father, forgive them. Very powerful. So it's not just something that he said, he actually lived it. And leaders live what they speak. They become practitioners of what they preach. Amen. Very important. Okay. Leadership lesson number three. Develop a countercultural vision. Develop countercultural vision. This notion of loving your enemies. Develop countercultural vision. So I like this, um, this reference that's on page 66 of the book. So Dr. King pens, my friends. I mean, I love the way he even starts this part of the, of the, of the, the chapter. Right? He uses the opening, my what? Friends. Understanding that he has a diverse audience that's reading his book. Perhaps some who are supporters and advocates of his work, but others who... Uh, are totally disgusted by his leadership and by his approach. But he still uses a term that, that's, that's strategic in building a bridge. Right? So he says, dear friends, or my friends, we have followed the so-called practical way for too long a time now. And it has led to deeper confusion and chaos. Time is cluttered with the wreckage of communities which surrender to hatred and violence for the salvation of our nation and the salvation of mankind. We must follow another way. This does not mean that we abandon our righteous efforts with every ounce of our energy. We must continue to rid this nation nation of the incubus of segregation. But we shall not in the process relinquish our privilege and our obligation to love. While abhorring segregation, we shall love the segregationists. This is the only way to create the beloved community. And actually, for those of you um, who would like to review this further, this notion of beloved community, uh, there's a lot of writing and actually sermon uh, reference uh, that, that Dr. King referenced quite often. It's, it, it, it's not as popular as, you know, the I have a dream speech, 
but it is definitely a beautiful vision of what interdependence can look like in a nation filled with diversity. Right? So, so if you have, have some time, definitely take a look at that, this notion of beloved community. But, but, but getting back to this theme, develop countercultural vision, please write this down. Leaders don't just see it like it is. They also see it like it could be. I mean, think about this. Any and everybody can tell it like it is. But it really requires critical thought, amazing compassion to tell it like it could be. Actually, sometimes when we tell it like it is, we create distance in relationships. But when we tell it like it could be, we garner support. We garner followership. I keep referencing this speech and that many of us are familiar with. The reason why Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech is so popular is because he cast a vision that resonated with the hearts of so many people. He didn't tell it like it was. He told it like it could be. It was a freeze frame of the future. How many movie buffs do we have in the place? Like, I love to watch movies. Yeah, how many people here like to watch movies? I love watching movies. Like, and that's one, one disappointment since uh, the emergence of the pandemic. I used to love just going to the movies almost on a weekly basis, me and my wife. And we would see the new movie. But most of you know this. Most movie writers, what's the first movie scene that they write? It's the end. It's the end. Right? And then they go from the end and walk their way back to the beginning. So that's usually the process. Most movie writers, they know exactly how they want to move to end, even if they don't know all of the the different turns that the, that the story will take. To be a leader, it's absolutely critical that you have vision. That you start, let's take away from you know, leadership guru Stephen Covey, with the end in mind. That you have this freeze frame of the future where we can potentially be. And Dr. King, he had that vision. I mean, even the, the last statement that we see, um, the next to last statement, while abhorring segregation, we shall love the segregationist. So it's this ability to be able to separate the problem from the person. I, I can see sin, but I don't necessarily designate the person as sin. I see the potential in the person. I see the potential in a community. I see the potential in an organization. I see the potential in an industry. But that requires work, critical analysis, and taking more steps. The average person can definitely point out error and gaps. But leaders aren't content with just identifying gaps and mishaps and errors. Leaders want to take it another level, another step forward. Well, if we address these gaps, what will our society, what will our organization, what will our industry, what will our relationships, what will they look like? And that's so countercultural. I, I hope you hear this from me. And you've probably experienced it in this, in this class. And many of you experienced it even before you came to EDU. Critical thought takes work. It takes work. It requires ongoing energy. It requires sacrifice. Most of the leaders that we talk about now who recurrently thought about ways to advance our society 
They had to sacrifice, and a lot of times their family sacrificed because of their commitment to their call. It requires work. That's the one part of it, and we alluded to that earlier. This is the second part of it. Demonstrating humility and compassion when you know more than others requires work. Because that's the shadow side of leadership. And when God blesses you with acute intellection, there's going to be a temptation to be arrogant, to feel that you're better than others. And so to remain committed to the value of humility, even when you know more, and to remain committed to walk with the person at their pace. Even though you know more and you could be three steps ahead. That's going to require work. It's going to require patience. But listen, it's absolutely necessary to lead well. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Can I get some head nods in the space? Okay. Let's go over them again. Leadership lesson number one was, give it back to me, I'm sorry. <laughs> Cultivate a tough mind and a, and a tender heart. Really important. Right? Don't just have the tough mind. Also couple it with the tender heart. Be compassionate. Let's, let's be real disciples of Christ. He had compassion for those that that crossed his path, that he intentionally engaged with. Tough minds in the heart. Leadership lesson number two. Establish a, firm Establish a firm foundation. Make sure that there's congruence between what you say and what you do. What you profess and how you live. If you want to exist in a department, in a relationship where love you know, is, is prioritized, well, you make sure that you're the first partaker in demonstrating love, leading with love. Okay? Build on a firm foundation. Credibility is that foundation. Integrity is that foundation. Okay? Are you worth leading? Should people follow you? Do you have the integrity where you will steward the trust of those who are with, who are, who are being followed by, who are following you? Okay. All right. Leadership lesson number three. Yeah, yeah. Develop countercultural vision. Okay. Don't stop at just seeing things the way that they are. Calibrate your vision where you can see what where things could could be. Okay? Really important. Where they could be. So, so in chapter five of Loving Your Enemies, um, Dr. King references um, the, the leadership of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, this goes back to 1862. I'm going to read an excerpt and then we'll 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 bring things to a close. So it says, Lincoln tried love and left love and left for all history a magnificent drama of reconciliation. When he was campaigning for the presidency, one of his arch enemies was a man named Stanton. For some reason, Stanton hated Lincoln. He used every ounce of his energy to degrade him in the eyes of the public. So deep rooted was Stanton's hate for Lincoln that he uttered unkind words about his physical appearance and sought to embarrass him at every point when the bitterest, uh, with the bitterest diatribes. But in spite of this, Lincoln was elected president of the United States. Then came the period when he had to select his cabinet. I like this. Which would consist of the persons who would be his most intimate associates in implementing his program. He started choosing men here and there for the various secretaryships. The day finally came for Lincoln to select a man to fill the all-important post of Secretary of War. Can you imagine 
whom Lincoln chose to fill this post, none other than the man named Stanton. There was an immediate uproar in the inner circle when the news began to spread. Advisor after advisor was, was heard saying, Mr. President, you are making a mistake. Do, do you know this man, Stanton? Are you familiar with all the ugly things he said about you? He is your enemy. He will seek to sabotage your program. Have you thought this through, Mr. President? Mr. Lincoln's answer was, was clear and to the point. Yes, I know Mr. Stanton. I am aware of all the terrible things he has said about me. But after looking over the nation, I find he is the best man for the job. So Stanton became Abraham Lincoln's Secretary of War and rendered an invaluable service to his nation and his president. Not many years later, Lincoln was assassinated. Many laudable things were said about him. Even today, millions of people still adore him as the greatest of all Americans. H.G. Wells selected him as one of the six great men of history. But of all the great statements made about Abraham Lincoln, the words of Stanton remain among the greatest. Standing near the dead body of the man he once hated, Stanton referred to him as one of the greatest men that ever lived and said, he now belongs to the ages. I mean, what a beautiful example and depiction of reconciliation. I mean, how many of us would choose the person who's been our greatest thorn to be a part of our administration? The person who's so counter to who we are and what we're committed to do to actually say, okay, how can we operate in partnership? And I would even say that Lincoln had a subliminal um, motive to say, hey, I'm going to find a way to move Stanton from the place of enemy to freedom. I mean, that is leadership at another level. And I'm saying that I think that's leadership that we can also model in our day-to-day -day lives and definitely in the work that, that we're called to, called to do. I love that. So I want to leave you with this. Um, <clears throat> In chapter 14, Dr. King brilliantly drafts um, this chapter, this sermon, that stylistically follows uh, the frame of, you know, the, the letters that Paul wrote uh, to, different, uh, to different Christians, whether that's in Corinth or Ephesus or Thessalonica. Um, and so he says, he, he starts the vision, if Paul was drafting a letter to, uh, to the Christians, to the American Christians, you know, in 1963, you know, what would that message potentially be? And so he litters in some of uh, the common colloquials that, that, that Paul uses um, in, in scripture, uh, some of his salutation language, the way that Paul tends to culminate like letters and epistles. And it's really powerful, so I, I really want you to pay special attention. Make sure that you're you're fully awake, you know, when you read uh, chapter 14. Uh, and, the, and the title of the, the, the sermon is Paul's Letter to an American Christian. So I want to share this, this excerpt with you and then share a few thoughts and then we'll, we'll conclude. So Dr. King pens, American Christians, I must say to you what I wrote to the Roman Christians years ago. Be not conformed to this world. But be ye, come on everybody, be ye transformed, a little more energy, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Remember what we talked about at the beginning of our time? At the heart of leadership is this word of what? Change. But if we're interested in changing our environment or an organization or a relationship, Change must first take place within us. Be ye, and we use the King James Version, be ye transform. That's pause for a moment, because when we look at the tense, it's, it's this notion of ongoing action. Transformation isn't, doesn't just happen one time. 
It is an iterative process. And when you're in leadership, yes, you're leading change, but through the process, you're also being what? Changed. Constantly. Your thinking's becoming more developed. Your humility is becoming more expanded. Your compassionate heart is growing. Right? There's this iterative process of development that continues to take place. I wish I had time to take you back to Dr. King's childhood. Most of you know this. Dr. King grew up in Atlanta, Georgia. His father was a pastor. But you can visibly see, if you take a look at his growth and development and his overall timeline, you see how he was constantly changing and growing and becoming more uh, defined in terms of his convictions as well as his voice. So it's an iterative process. We're constantly transformed by the renewing of our minds. He says, be of good comfort, be of one mind and live in peace. It is improbable that I will see you in America, but I will meet you in God's eternity. Those words kind of sound prophetic, don't they? Yeah. And now unto him who is able to keep us from falling and lift us from the dark valley of despair to the bright mountain of hope, from the midnight of desperation to the daybreak of joy, to him be power and authority forever and ever Amen. Isn't that powerful? I mean, the word imagery that Dr. King uses, I mean, in this last piece of text is very powerful. And if, if it feels very similar to language that Paul uses in some of his some of his letters. Uh, some of you may know this. Uh, one of the scholars that Dr. King um, uh, paid close attention to was Gandhi. And probably one of the one of the leadership quotes that we reference often that's, that that Gandhi coined is "Be the change that you want to see in the world." And I know I think that's a slight paraphrase, but you get it. That's the notion, right? And I would say that that same uh, meaning and theme is recurring throughout this book, "Strength to Strength to Love." But what's the application to us? We're not Dr. King, even though we can appreciate his leadership. We're not living in 1963. Things are different. What's the appeal to us? Even though leaders change, the essence of leadership remains the same. The necessity of leadership is still prominent. In every age and in every era, there is always a need for leadership. And I think the question that all of us we have to grapple with, and this was definitely a question that I'm sure Dr. King had to think through. Abernathy, who was a part of his leadership team, James Lawson, who was a part of his leadership team. John Lewis, who recently passed away. Many of you know John Lewis. And so many others who were a part of his cadre. How will I steward the influence that God has given me? That's the big question. How will I steward the influence that God has given me. How will I steward the voice that God has given me? How will I steward the resource? Please know there are plenty of people that would love to be in a classroom. To have an experience like this where you can think critically, holistically, and you've been blessed with this opportunity. What do you do? How do you use it for good? Tough mind. 
It's in the heart. Firm foundation. Counterculture vision. See your enemies different. I would even encourage those in this room, stop using the word enemies. Call them potential friends. <laughs> I know that requires attention because some of you, you, you just thought of a person. I mean, you actually just saw their face. You're like, I don't know about that one, Dr. King. I want you to think about it. Leaders are intentional about leveraging a countercultural approach to effectuate change. You have that. Strength of love. Strength of love. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you.